Hi, I'm Katie and this is episode 48 of Ornamentations, which should be a really fun one. I don't have a fabulous trip to the attic to talk it, or rather enthuse about today, but I do have two finishes that are absolutely gorgeous and I'm excited to share with you. I have some whip progress and then I had a very special stitchy visit that I'll be telling you all about today. However, we'll start today with finishes because since I saw you last, I had both a start and a finish. Mother's Day really snuck up on me this year. I finished my last floss tube. I was stitching away on my tiny blackbird. And then I looked at the calendar and thought, oh crap, I had already planned out what I was going to do. So I've shown you before, I bought the alternative trees pattern uh, from Modern Folk Embroidery. These are alternate centers from the 2023 Stitch Along Reaching Skyward. And I absolutely love these. These are gorgeous. And this is the one I picked. I thought I would stitch that as a standalone for my mom. And this is my finish. This is on Legacy Linen 45 Count Nightingale stitched with Soisserfine. I've used my own ribbon edge ornament finishing tutorial, which I'll link in the description if you haven't seen it before. The only alterations I made to the processes seen in that tutorial was that I lightly padded with just a single layer of felt the top piece here, which gives it just a touch of softness. I think that's a nice addition. And then rather than fusing the piece on, I pinned and laced it on to mat board. I wanted the placement of the piece on my oval here to be really exact. And I think that turned out really well. The back is just a beautiful piece of coordinating silk that I had from Stash. I thought the tone on tone was lovely. This is the kind of thing my mom really appreciates. I knew she would like it. She was thrilled, so I barely squeaked this out. I was putting the final stitches on in on Saturday night, right before Mother's Day, and was so relieved that I made it. So this is Alternative Trees. Again, stitched on 45 Count Nightingale from Legacy Linen with this color of Swasserfine. So if you look at the pattern for alternative trees, there are actually two um, contrasting colors here. And I did originally intend to do that. Here I've just left the space where there was supposed to be the second color empty. That was because at first I couldn't decide. I had two options one lighter and one darker. I'll put all of these in the description so that you can do your own shading if you'd like to try something similar. These are all beautiful colors that shade beautifully. However, I couldn't decide once I got stitching whether or not I'd like my contrasting color to be lighter or darker. The lighter was actually what I ended up using for finishing here. It's perfect match. And I liked the look of the negative space. Not to mention that I was under pretty serious time pressure. So I just left it single color and I think that's really successful, but it would also be beautiful to use one of the coordinating colors. So like if you used the dark, for example, that would make this design pop out even more. So again, I'll put all the information on threads, linen and pattern in the description and that's my first finish. I chose 45 count instead of 38 because I wanted this to be a little smaller, not too big. My mom likes to hang things up on a hook she's got in her kitchen, so she rotates all kinds of different stitchy pieces there throughout the year. And this is perfect because it's not tied to a specific holiday, so it's a kind of interseasonal thing that she can put out. And I borrowed this from her to film today's floss too, but otherwise it's out in her kitchen and she loves it. So happy Mother's Day, Mom. I was so glad that I got this done. And then I also managed to finish my tiny blackbird. I did the finishing on this yesterday. 
This is Blackbird's Sweet Land. Well, sorry. This is Blackbird's um, In Full Glory from their book, Sweet Land of Liberty. We looked at this last time and I made some changes, but I also made some mistakes. So this is stitched on 56 count weeks linen. And I started this at the attic. I was doing the zigzags and I, Jean was stitching with us because you know, Jean is stitching with you. You've got to have some high count stitching going. And I swear, I counted the zigzags four times before I made the turn to make sure I had that right. And apparently I can't count because I'm one zigzag short, which meant that once I worked the house all the way up, I had this and another star in and I realized that I didn't have enough space for the chimneys. So I went back and counted again and realized that I was one zigzag short. So that meant I had to compress some elements at the top. I did not have space to work the eagle, so I just removed it and had the plain flagpole instead and then put in some plain filler and then otherwise just left that open because again, I like negative space and you know, this size is just so tiny and charming. So this is a standard spool of thread and I just, oh my God, I know I went on it about this at length the last time, but it really is just so incredibly charming. So much so that you don't notice all the mistakes on here, of which there are plenty. So not only is my border too short, it's not wide enough because everything's too close to the edge. I had to remove the last row of stitches from the flag, but again, you don't notice and I, you know, I went back and counted. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. I know what happened here, but for all the mistakes on this piece, all you know about it is, is all you see is that it is charming, tiny, and fabulous. I enjoyed this so much. I also, I think, more fully understand why Jean Lee says to always go forward and not go backward. That's because frogging on a 56 count is a major pain. It's actually the worst thing about stitching on 56 count. So if you can find a way not to frog and to just live with your mistakes, that's definitely the better way forward. A few other things about this piece. I received quite a lot of questions after the last one about process. This is one strand of swastrophene over two linen threads. This is not stitched over one on 56 count. I am not that crazy. Over two is as far as I will go on very high count linen. But that's all you need. It's tiny and fabulous. And this is my conversion, which I shared in the last episode, but I'll post again in the description of this one. There is supposed to be a second blue, and I do have a suggestion for that. I'll put it in the description. And where it's used on the pattern is in some of the filler up here, and then in the blue petals on the carnation. However, I blew right past that when I was picking my colors. It wasn't until I got to actually stitching the carnation that I realized that I was missing the blue. As you can see, I did have a gray color in stash, but the more I thought about it, the more I liked what that intense slaty blue brings to this. So I just stuck to the same one for the whole piece and I don't think it's missing anything. But if you'd like that second blue, I do have a suggestion for you. And then, as I mentioned, I think this is Swasserfine on 56 count. <laughs> oh, this is this. I love it. I'm definitely going to do way more tiny smalls because this is just amazing. It's so charming and tiny. I'm hooked. I also did get some questions about more general process. How do I stitch and just all of that. So those of you who are longtime viewers will have heard this before, but bear with me. So I usually cross stitch in hand with the stabbing method rather than the sewing method. However, that comes with one giant caveat. I always wet block my pieces afterwards to remove the distortion. Every 
single time, whether it's a large piece, a small piece, a sampler, a box, I always wet block it. I do not recommend stitching in hand unless you are going to remove the distortion afterwards. If you're not prepared to do that, always use a hoop. It will reduce the distortion and make your final product look better. I take a shortcut after doing my stitching, but that's the only way I would recommend stitching in hand regularly. And I also never advise using the sewing method. I know it's very popular, it's faster, no judgment on you if you like to use it. Speaking only for myself, I think that the stabbing method gives you a lot more control over how your threads lay in the fabric and in the weave. It gives you much neater stitching and I'm very into that. Another question that comes up all of the time is the sharpness and definition of my crosses. That's not a function of how I stitch. That's a function of how the thread and the linen relate to each other. So I tend to go for lighter coverage. As I mentioned, this is Swasserfine on 45 count where most people would use 103. I go up to Surfine at 45 and above and that is what gives you these super sharp defined crosses. It's because the thread has room for the crosses to sit neatly next to each other in the weave. Now, some stitchers would describe that as the threads sinking into the linen. I really like the sharp and defined look that gives. If you'd like to know how to do this with your own stitching, I give extensive information about how to pair the different threads out there with the different counts in the specialty thread tutorial part one, which I will link in the description. But moving on. So those were just some general questions I got about my stitching. Stitchy visitors. Oh, you guys, there's been so much excitement in my life lately. It's going to be quite boring to go back to normal life. So since I saw you last, I had some friends come to visit. Karen and Bren of Fox and Rabbit came over for an evening. We looked at all my pieces. We had dinner. We had lots and lots of chat and laughter. It was such a wonderful time. They are so incredibly charming and fun. I enjoyed meeting them more than I can say. And they're also incredibly kind because the way the timing worked out, they had to cross the Golden Great Bridge and drive through San Francisco at rush hour. You guys, that's love right there because honestly, if you know anything about our Bay Area traffic, that's a miserable experience and they battled through that to come and see me. I actually felt horrible about it. That's so much to ask of someone. I rarely go to Needle in a Haystack because I have to cross the San Mateo Bridge to get there and I pick very specific times of day to do so when the traffic is least intense. So that they made such an effort was just so touching and I enjoyed it so much. We just talked stitching for ages and had such a great time. They truly are delightful, which you know if you watch their floss tube, but yeah, they're just like that in person. And they also brought me gifts, which was so nice. Really their presence was the gift especially considering everything they went through to get here. But they brought me gigantic cuts of their two newest linen colors. Seriously, they're so nice. That was just so lovely of them. So this is Dirt Track. They bought, brought me 36 count linen, which I for one love because Goblins looks great in it. So I really like like 36, 37, 38. Although, as you might have heard, I'm also newly addicted to high count linen. So Dirt Track is a neutral with more modeling in it. I know Brenda and Laura have raved about it. They're both in um, the fabric and of the month club, and so they already have this. So that's Dirt Track, which is one of the new colors from Fox and Rabbit. And then the other is a lovely neutral. I love a good neutral. And this is Desert Taipan. Oh, that, that's better, sorry. All the light in here, it's really washing out. Oh my gosh, look. I think this is like a half yard. They were insanely generous, so I'm going to have to stitch something on that because this is 
absolutely beautiful. So I will link their floss tube in the description. If you're watching me, you're probably already watching Karen and Bren, but if you're not watching them, you should be because they are such lovely people and so much fun. I can't wait to have the chance to meet them again. Really, it's been such a fun time. So much stitchy overload really between going to the attic and meeting so many new stitchers and then coming back and having that promptly be followed up by a visit from Karen and Brad themselves was just too cool. We talked caskets and stitching and cross stitch and linen for hours and hours and hours. It was a great time. And as part of that, I brought out all the stitching. I collected the pieces from my mom that I've given to her, all of my caskets. We looked at everything. My dining table was covered with basically all the embroidery I've ever done. It was fun, but it also reminded me of a few things of my own that are left undone. So this is my Gloriana box. The lid was one of my earliest embroideries after I joined Cabinet of Curiosities and started experimenting with all of these techniques. Gloriana is the titular fairy queen from Edmund Spencer's poem, The Fairy Queen, which you've heard me talk about in reference to the Britomart casket. Gloriana herself never actually appears in the poem. She's only referred to, which is why she doesn't get a casket of her own. But when I was doing practice pieces, she got a practice box as a companion piece to the Brita Mark casket. I talked all about this in my second ever floss tube. So if you'd like to hear all about this and take a closer look, episode two. However, while the exterior of this is completely finished, it's even got its gilded feet, I never finished the interior of this. And there's a story behind that. I had started, and oh my gosh, I'm almost done, an interior piece. So this was supposed to be the lovers under a beaded garland, which is a form that you see commonly in 17th century beaded baskets. And this is supposed to be Arthur. That would indeed be the Arthur of legend who in the poem is in love with Gloriana, the fairy queen and on a quest to seek her. And then our padded invisible figure here is Gloriana herself. So as you can see, I didn't even properly lace this piece. I just pinned the sides because I already had all the beating done. And I thought, oh, I'll just like throw the figures up and have this done in no time. That was five years ago. I never went back to this. What happened was the beading I had done before, and these are some of my tiniest antique beads. They top about 50 beads to the inch, the leaves on the garland there. And I blew through the figure of Arthur pretty quickly. I mean, this is so long ago that silver is tarnishing. Oh, look, and I didn't finish his feet. That's just felt. <laughs> Oops. And then I started the pieces for Gloriana. I didn't like them. And then I set this aside in a snit and quite honestly forgot about it until I started rooting through my closet to find everything to show Karen and Bren. It's long past time for this to be finished. There's really not much more to do on this. So I'm going to try and bring this back out finish this off and then get it put inside the Gloriana box for a full finish on this. The lid was started in 2014. That's definitely my oldest whip. So that's a hopeful plan. We'll see if that actually comes to fruition because yeah, years ago I thought that this would be something I just whipped out and oh yeah, it's still just sitting here. Oh dear. Anyways, let's talk about other whips. Whips which have had work done on them more recently than five years ago. And for today, that would be Plum Street Samplers This Happy Morning. So since I saw you last, I have primarily been stitching on my two tiny finishes and then cutting a ton of linen for the upcoming kits. 
but I did get some more work done on this happy morning. I'm putting in the structure of the barn. I've done absolutely nothing on the berries, so, so much for that plan. But I could see the barn taking shape and I have really been enjoying that. So that's what I've been focusing on. I have also had an idea about the reds in this piece. So that's the other reason I want to stitch the entire barn is see where that ends up. And then we'll talk about what happens next. So again, these are my threads and then the next thing I need to do in the context of focusing on the barn is start working that roof because the barn itself has actually not been too painful in terms of I don't like block stitching because it's patterned and that's pulling you along. But that roof is just single color solid. So I need to get going on that. I think I have chosen my gray but I definitely need to get that in, test it, make sure it works because sometimes, honestly, the colors you're so certain will work in a conversion are the ones that give you the most trouble. So that gray looks like it's perfect to me, but I might get it in there on the linen with the reds and think that that is a complete and utter disaster. <laughs> so I really need to get going on that. So what I hope to do with this happy morning before I see you next is some very serious work on the bar and hopefully get the rest of the structure in and make a real start on that roof. So it really is looking gorgeous. I love this piece even more than I expected. I think the vibrancy of the colors, the beauty of the silks just really adds so much. I did also manage to take a few photos of the ground that I think think give a little better idea of the sheen and quality of the go ones. So I'm going to insert those here and hopefully you'll get a better sense of what I'm talking about when I enthuse about the sheen and luster of filament silk because it's such an extraordinary effect in person that you really don't get to see most of it on camera. Okay, also, since I saw you last, I went and picked up a piece of framing. This is the Christmas in July kit, which we'll talk about in more detail closer to the time, and that's Brenda Gervais, Santa Stops Here. This is the first piece of my own stitching that I've ever actually had framed. The framed piece behind me is Blackbird's Dear Daughter of Mine, seen in episode 27. That was stitched and framed by my mom as a gift for me. So this is the first time I've ever framed anything of my own. I usually prefer to glue it and stick it on a box. And I love the frame. I deliberately chose a, you know, kind of chunky black frame as a counterweight to the border. However, I noticed after I picked this up that it's ever so slightly off center. There's more linen on this side than on this side. And it really is very slight. I think most people wouldn't even notice it. However, I took it back to the framer and this is who I used. And they told me that you can't be exact with cloth, which is not true. I delivered to this, this to them, pinned, mounted, and ready for framing with completely equal borders. So this is a matter of adjusting it inside the frame, which they would not do. I'm not really best pleased about that, but I do love how it looks in the frame. I think stitching itself is beautiful so I am trying to look past that I'm not going to use them again and I think the real lesson to draw from that is that needlework probably needs to be handled by specialists in needlework because otherwise you get told things like it's not possible to be exact with cloth which I know isn't true because I pinned this for framing myself and I spent about two hours going over it with a roller to make sure that everything was completely exact so that's crap. I did spring for museum glass on this, which is, <laughs> there's so much light coming off my windows that it's defeating even the museum glass. However, when it's just on display up on the shelves, it's, 
noticeably much less reflective than regular gloss. It is, however, also much more expensive than regular gloss. So if you're concerned about the cost of framing, that would be a really good way to keep the cost of framing down because the blackbird that my mom gave me just has regular gloss and honestly, it looks beautiful. I sprung for museum gloss on this one because it's a model that needs to be photographed, but that was really the only reason in future I might just go for regular glass. So that's Santa Stops here, which we will be seeing again, as I said, closer to the kit, re kit release. Speaking of upcoming kit releases, I can now announce a release date for the kit for Big Blue House Pim Keep Drum by Stacey Nash. That will be released on June 6th at 8.15 a.m. on my website. The link will be in the description. Full details will be in the next floss tube. But just to mention a couple points, I can't reserve kits in advance. It is always strictly first come, first serve. And then the kits include all of the ground linen, the threads, and the beads that I used for the strawberry. But it does not include the chart. You need to provide that yourself. And it does not include the ribbon. Although in my materials to you, I have included all the information on where you can find this or other ribbons that would be a good option to add to your big blue house and keep drum. There's also been a dye lot change on one of the browns from what I myself used. Our darker brown in the threads, and these are the threads that you will receive, is has had a change and it's a bit darker and a little bit more vibrant. I actually think that's a feature and not a bug because when I was stitching, I thought the browns were a little too close. You see the scallops in the roof more clearly on camera than you do in person. In person, it really disappears. So as I was stitching, the problem was I was so far into the roof, I didn't see a good second option. So I went ahead with my only complaint about this conversion would have been that the browns were a little too close. The dye lot change has actually solved that problem for us. So I think your stitch will actually be even more striking than my own, but I did want to alert you to that just so there are no surprises when you get your kit. And that's Big Blue House Pink. Oh God, look at that bow. I just love that. The details, the little strawberry hanging off. This was fun. So Big Blue House Pink Keep Drum available June 6th at 8.15 a.m. The run of stock kits will be larger than it was with Tulip Festival, but I am not sure yet if I will be able to take pre-orders. I will get back to you on that on June 6th when I can see what the thread situation is. The reason I will not, I, the reason I may not be able to take pre-orders is that we're coming to the end of a dye lot on one of the colors and I will not hold pre-orders on a thread needing to be dyed again. That has been the holdup on Joyous Season, which I know you guys are still waiting for on the pre-orders. My sincere apologies on that. We are missing one thread. Everything else is here. It has been kitted. It is ready to go. That thread has now been dyed. However, it is behind schedule. That has stressed me out considerably. It kills me to have promised you something and not to have gotten it to you. The thread's been dyed. It's in transit. Given how erratic international shipping is these days, that means I have absolutely no information on when it will be here and ready to ship to you. However, once I get it, it will be out in the mail the very next day. If you have concerns, please feel free to email me. My contact information is in the description. The best way to reach me is always through the content, is through the contact form on my website. My sincere apologies about the whole thing. The supply chain has oh, thrown up quite a doozy this time. However, there is progress. We're getting there. Fingers crossed. We are very close on kits actually going out. And then the last thing I have is actually, this was supposed to be in the last episode, but I was so excited rambling and babbling that I didn't follow my own outline. And I meant to tell you about a new to me floss tuber. This is one of the people who I met in Arizona and her name is Megan. Her channel is Megan the Wide-Eyed Stitcher. I'll be linking it in the description. I hadn't actually watched her before I met her in Arizona and she's absolutely delightful. She has a really like calm, soothing voice too and a 
beautiful background. She filmed her most recent episode in front of her Chesapeake Bay wall and she really has very much flair for display. It's a gorgeous background. And just from a literary geeky note, she has a Poe wall, as in an Edgar Allan Poe wall. So when she told me that, it was just like, oh yeah, we're gonna be friends. You are cool. She's also got a delightful floss tuber. So if you're not watching Megan, link to her channel in the description, go and check her out. I know you will like her as much as I do. That is about all that I have for this episode. And then for next episode, I got a little distracted from my plans by needing a Mother's Day gift. And there was a fair amount of stitching in this. It took me a bit longer than I planned. It did turn out beautifully though, and my mom liked it. So that's priceless, right? But for next time, we will have the release of the Big Blue House kit. And then I really truly am going to work on some of my plans that I was supposed to work on this time, which would be Not Forgotten Farms, Cedar Wax Wing, and then my Tiny Plum Street Samplers Cereal Bowl Collection. Again, now that I've done one tiny small, I've got to have another tiny small going. So I've cut the linen, which is 5363 waffle cone and I'm hoping to start that today after my floss tube has uploaded and I can now migrate my threads from the blackbird into my palm street. So I'll be starting that. I'll be making some progress on cedar waxwing. Hopefully we'll see some more on my barn, maybe even a roof. I mean, I don't want to get wild in my promises, but that would be pretty cool. So stay tuned next time to see what I get up to. I'll see you again in two weeks and until then, happy stitching.